guys. So today I will set our text out by talking about the life cycles of Moses. Actually guys, the life cycle of Moses is status when the spore from the major sporophyte are dispersed to the favorable habitats such as moist soils and tree buds. The spores will germinate into one cell thick filaments then known as protonema. As you can see here, this protonema have a large surface area which enhances the absorption of water and minerals. Once the protonema is formed, it will produce one or more buds, the lifted things that you can see in this picture with the light green one. This bud light will grow from the apical meristem to form the gametophore. You will get a body most of gametophyte with a protonema and one or more gametophore. So, what happens after the gametophyte is form one? Male and female gametophyte will then continue the fertilization process. As in human, we do have gonad, an organ that produces gametes in our body, which are the testes and the ovary. But in plants, we call it as the gametangia. For the male gametophyte, the gametangia is known as the enteridia. While for the female gametophyte, the gametangia is known as the archegonia. So for the male gametophyte, as you can see here, the green structure there is the anteridia, or singular we call it as anteridium, and the brown structure there is the sperms. One anteridium cell can produce many sperms. As for the female gametophyte, as you can see here, the green structure there is the archegonia, or singular we call it as archegonia. Different from the anteridia, one archegonium cell can only produce one egg. So, for the fertilization process, the flagellated sperm from the anteridia will swim through a film of water to the egg in response to the chemical extracted. Different from human, egg will not be released, but instead, it will just remain in the base of, of the archegonia. So, the sperm from the anteridia will come and fuse with the egg in the archegonia where fertilization occurs within the archegonia. So, Nazira, what will happen after that? Okay, so after fertilization, let's say the sperm and egg both are together successfully um, fused, it will then further develop and form the deployed zygote, and then the zygote will then further develop into an embryo like this. We simply wanted to show the fusion between these two by symbolizing the white part as the egg and the brown part as the sperm. So this is an embryo. However, after the embryo further develops into a sporophyte, it will look like this. Somehow like this. This green part here is the gametophyte structure and this brown part here is the sporophyte structure. This is the stalk and this is the capsule. And within the capsule is where meiosis will occur in order for the sporangia to produce spores, haploid spores. And like, like, I, like me and my teammates have mentioned earlier, after the spores are released and under favorable conditions, it will then develop into the protonema and then the bud and then the gametophyte again. And then if fertilization occurs, it will form the sporophyte. So in short, the cycle between the sporophyte and gametophyte structure uh, the alternation of generation between those, those two are then continuous. However, it is important to note that the gametophyte structure is much more dominant than the sporophyte structure. As you can see here, the sporophyte is still nutritionally dependent towards the gametophyte. And moreover, some fun facts about the mosses is that the rhizoids are not actually composed of tissues, but rather they are cells. And in fact, the rhizoids are lacking in specialized conducting cells. Therefore, the rhizoids do not actually play a major, major role in water and mineral transport. Moreover, in order for the success rate of fertilization um, to be higher, it is best preferred for the both for both the male and the female gametophyte to be closer to one another because as we all know the sperm requires a thin film of moisture in order for the sperm to swim to go within the archegonia and to fertilize with the egg so have you guys ever wondered like what are the economical importance of mosses for your information mosses also have their economical importance they may be small, but there are some surprising ways where they can be used economically. For example, pit mosses. 
Fetal muscles are an important source of filth in some countries. They are derived largely from sphagnum moss, and about 95% of peat mosses harvested and burned in Ireland to generate electricity. In construction, mosses also provide chinking and even building material. Mosses are among the first colonizers of disturbing sites that they've been used in so-called green roof technology to vegetate roof. Last but not least, in Japan, they use mosses on walls and roof for both aesthetic and practical ones. They are not trying to get rid of mosses as its moisture characteristic. And for your information, there are a moss garden in Japan where they call it as Zen Garden. Interesting, right? So, what about their ecological importance? Okay, as we all know, every living thing has their own ecological roles, ecological importance. Well, some theory of ecological importance for mosses are they can prevent occurrence of landslide, they can act as biological indicator, and they can act as natural carbon sinks. First, they can prevent occurrence of landslide by acting like a giant sponge that can retain moisture. Basically, they will absorb water and they can hold the soil together through intertwines of rhizot and stems. This condition will prevent soil erosion and occurrence of landslide. Moving on, they can act as biological indicator because they have a high sensitivity to level of moisture and level of chemical. They can take up a lot of chemical due to their unique life cycle strategies and physiological behavior. This is also possible due to their poikilohydric adaptation, which means their water content changes depends on the level of moisture in their surrounding environment. I've also I've already come across an uh, article or research that already used mosses to monitor atmospheric heavy metals. So meaning here. Moses is really helpful in determining how polluted that one specific area is. Last but not least, mosses act as natural carbon sinks. I'll take example of sphagnum or peat moss, which is a major component of peat. So actually we can uh, they we can found sphagnum in this model I've created here, the bog model. So the dead sphagnum can be found in the peat moss layer and the fresh sphagnum is on the uppermost layer. So this both is very important. This, the uppermost layer can can uh, be can provide a habitat to other organism. And the peat moss layer is the one that acts as natural carbon sinks. So they are very important as global reservoir of um, organic carbon com compound and they can stabilize atmosphere uh, carbon carbon dioxide levels. So actually there there is a there is much more of importance for Economic importance, ecological importance of mosses, but this is all we can share today. And so that's all for from us. Thank you so much for listening.